Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is the future of work track, and this happens to be the future of human resources subcomponent. Um, so we're glad everybody can be here. Um, my name is Aaron Kissel. I look after the research group for Corporate Executive Board, or CEB. Um, we have about 5,000 uh, CHROs um, that uh, we get the chance to do a lot of research for. Um, we've been asked to sort of set up this discussion as much of a debate as possible about where um, human resources is going. And for those of you in the audience, that um, impacts your world in terms of where spending might go or offers that might get purchased. Our hope is to sort of bring a little bit of information to that. Um, there's sort of four major topics we're going to go through. I think one is sort of just generally the role of the CHRO, um, how that's changing, uh, how the relationship with the board is changing, and there's sort of a, a couple of different paths that, that might go down. Uh, the role of analytics um, and data and how HR is being run um, and how it changes how people are managed. Um, the role of culture um, and how that is changing in companies and how it's managed um, in different ways. Um, and, then, and then lastly, sort of the role of the business, quote unquote, as a buyer of HR and talent related products and how that might open up how things are bought and sold in the training and development space. Um, so I'm going to do a quick introductions for the panel. I'm going to let them do about a minute, and then we'll sort of jump into the debate. So thank you very much. Let's start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Maycumber. I actually do not have a long history in HR, um, <laughs> but I founded a company uh, three years ago called Who Knows, which we're trying to help uh, HR executives like yourself to finally understand who knows what and who knows who within the company using machine learning. So we can give you an always up-to-date talent inventory, collaboration graph to drive analytics, uh, learning, internal mobility initiatives uh, with machine learning. My name is Erin Anderson. I am the uh, SVP of HR at 2U. I have about 17 years of experience in recruiting and human capital management. And I have been uh, started with uh, 2U uh, just over six years ago, started with a company about 120. Employees were now uh, grown to 1,200, so I have a unique experience of uh, starting in a, in a startup organization and growing um, to a high growth company. So hopefully I can add some value to learning about evolving a culture in that type of environment. Uh, my name is Mike Metzger, and I'm the CEO of Payscale. I also do not come with an HR background, uh, unless you count the 10 years I've been at Payscale. We do, we collect information on what people get paid, and then we um, offer that back as a subscription service to businesses and individuals. Uh, individuals get it for free, businesses uh, buy it as a SaaS offering. We have about uh, close to 6,000 customers, and we've been in business for about 12 years. So my name is Peter Capelli. I'm a professor of management at the Wharton School. I direct our Center for Human Resources, and I do have a background in this. And, <laughs> and I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Chase, and I'm the founder and president of Uncharted Group, a consulting company that works in the biotech and pharmaceutical space, uh, about anything around leadership development, talent management, um, and presence, biotech, and pharma. So I've been in the industry of pharma and biotech for about 19, 20 years now. And uh, I actually fell into this HR arena more by accident because I really could not uh, stand the way that training and learning development was being run. Um, and so I just I felt this need to come in and help disrupt it and uh, make it something that folks would really grow and, and learn. Um, I'm a huge believer that you've got to run learning development as a business um, and not as a support center. Awesome. All right, we've got a great panel. Um, I'm going to start, I think, probably in an area of real strength, given the panel that we have around sort of the debate around analytics. Um, uh, last week, I was at the Gates Foundation for two days with heads of talent management from um, some of the biggest companies in the world. And I got to do 90 minutes on a debate that we had set up around um, the rate of adoption of talent analytics. And on one side, there is unbelievably cool companies there's a ton of money moving into the space. And on the other side, we did nine months of work on the state of HR analytics within the human resources function. And there is a very, very wide range of sophistication, but very few companies um, that are really, really in a position to take advantage of the technology that is getting adopted. And we set it up as a who are the winners and losers in this debate. 
you've got venture capitalists and CEOs and, and funders, and, and then you've got sort of a break on all that, which is the ability to digest and use the data that's coming. And so I might just ask people to go through here and weigh in a little bit about what do you think is going to change in the trajectory of the adoption of analytic type capabilities, and, and what, do, what can we do to help accelerate that to the extent that we believe that it's a good outcome? Um, what both can incumbent companies do to uh, uh, put themselves in the position to take advantage of those resources, and what, from a technology perspective, might change that allows adoption to go faster and easier versus mm -hmm. companies having to actually work it all the way through. I don't know who might want to jump in, but it's sort of for, for there are two CEOs on the, yeah. on the venture <laughs> side, I'd be curious what it's like selling every day into that space and what you think might make it go faster and easier over time. Uh, I can start. Uh, it's frustrating. Um, it, it, to be honest, uh, it's one of those things where I think everyone would agree you've seen how big data AI machine learning has transformed almost every other business function, marketing, sales, supply chain, operations, um, and HR and uh, people operations is still growing. And it's definitely accelerating, but I can't tell you how many times I've gone into companies and said, you should worry about this, and they just don't yet. Um, and even the, the analytics groups within companies, they feel embattled in trying to justify their existence and their budget. And when the reality, for probably a lot of people in this room, it's just one of those stupid, obvious things, like why, why do you have to fight this? Um, and I think that's part of the overall transformation we're seeing in HR from more tactical, you know, traditional HR to people strategy, talent management. Um, so we actually are segmenting our market as we go to people, and if the company does not have a um, talent analytics group, we don't even talk to them. They're, they're just not there yet. Um, they're not ready, and I'm not there to convince them to it. The, the market should, and then they'll catch up. So I could talk a lot more, but feel yeah, free. <laughs> I mean, I would mostly agree with that. The bulk of our customers actually have less than 2,000 employees, and um, it's a, um, our perspective on it is um, if you're going to do talent and analytics, you, have, you ought to start with compensation because that's actually something that you have a bunch of information on. But the, the challenge is even in getting compensation to be dealt with in an analytical fashion uh, often have to do with um, lack of integration with other systems, the amount of friction involved with trying to actually get information in and usable in an insightful way, um, probably more so, and this was to Chris's point, exec team buy-in, right? If the exec team doesn't see it as part of the core strategic asset, it's just not going to happen. And then um, we need to do a better job of selling ROI and, and providing kind of what the payoff is. So I guess um, I see this as part of a bigger story. And the bigger story is um, that the human resource function these days across companies is going in very different directions. And I think you're right, it's driven from the top down. There isn't very much that's being driven by HR per se these days. Even things that are HR specific like performance management, like the debate about dumping performance appraisals, if it's happening, it's being driven by the level above. And uh, you see companies that are doing incredibly cool things with analytics, and then you see more companies that are just struggling to figure out what a nine box is, right? Um, and the number of companies that don't know what their cost of turnover is, which is the basic, you know, the absolutely most basic thing, um, is pretty amazing. So I think this in some ways is a good thing because I think for a long time we have just had companies all trying to copy a model which used to be the GE model, which frankly nobody could copy unless you were GE and had all the resources to do that. So I think the liberating thing at the moment is companies are much more free to go in their own direction. Um, the problem is that unless you're folks at the very top, and by that I don't mean the HR folks, I mean the board of directors and the C-suite operating committee, understand the financial implications of what you're doing in HR, it's going nowhere. And I think the problem with that, frankly, in terms of your question about what could we do to, to advance that, um, there isn't a very persuasive story yet that you can easily roll out to the C-suite folks 
about the return on investments in these sorts of things. Now, I don't mean that vendors don't have a story they will tell you. Uh, I just mean that that doesn't mean it's very persuasive to the folks at the top. So a persuasive story is one that is internal to your company where you can show, if we do this, we will save this much or our performance will in increase by this much. And I think that seems to be the holdup in companies that haven't made more progress where the pressure is from the bottom up. And that is a hard thing to change. I would say um, where we are, we, we have made an investment in technology at this point that is now equipping us to do exactly what you all have been saying. And so to your point before, we had you know, five, six different systems pulling data that weren't talking to one another. And uh, it became very difficult to actually see what that story was actually saying. Um, so now what we, we have one ERP system for the organization, and all of that data is coming in in a consistent way, and it's reportable. Um, and actually now it, the, the question is, how much of this data is really important, right? Because we almost, we have a data overload in a way. And so now what we're working with our data team on is trying to examine what's the most influential, what data do we really need to be focused on, and how is that going to impact the organization? So I think um, it's important for organizations to make an investment earlier on to make sure that you're getting yourself the types of systems that you need to be able to pull the data that will ultimately help you. That's a great point, by the way. It's database management that's the hang up for most companies. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll uh, just um, building on that. It, a lot of research we've done in terms of adoption and spend and what would accelerate it comes to this sort of, the data will get easier to use over time, that somehow a middle, middleware will emerge as the savior that will integrate these different and bespoke systems. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is when you ask the next question, who's working on that and what providers might make that happen, um, at least on the practitioner side, it's sort of a, I can't wait till that vendor calls me because uh, that's the thing I need and I'm not gonna be able to do on my own. I'm just curious, for you, you know, have you seen anybody out there, but the, the data quality, data complexity, and, and other places like marketing made big jumps when middleware kind of got introduced to sort of set standards for how data is gonna get collected and measured and allowed people to come on top of it. Is there any progress that people have seen out there around that sort of data standards and quality that would unleash what we have? Um, and, and we haven't, and in all of our interviews, we haven't found it yet, but that might be a big opportunity that might allow some of this to actually start to happen. I would say I'm yet to see it. Um, I think it depends on the organization as well. So, you know, my frame of reference is working at, you know, Sanofi Genzyme, which is part of a massive fourth largest pharma company in the world, Fortune 100 company. And you've got 115,000 employees, 120,000 employees, and you're trying to bring this big data in and have a smooth system. Um, it's a real challenge. At the same time, you know, doing some consulting on the other side, I have an, a company that's still fighting with the nine box, um, and that's their bread and butter, and that's what they want to do. Um, so I think it really depends on the scale of the organization. Um, you know, I think a key learning for us over on the Santa Fe side is that we just had too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, we had too many systems that were trying to talk, and I think rather than just putting the Band-Aid slightly ripping it off, we just needed to rip it off, mm -hmm. and I think it would have helped us quicker. Yeah, I, I have not seen it myself. Um, I am fortunate, though, that within 2U, we have a really strong data team um, that has been able to do really phenomenal things on the marketing side for us. And so I am um, really just partnering with them at this point um, and trying to take lessons learned from what they've already done in other areas of our business and having them help me to um, you know, make that come to life within HR. <coughs> But could I, uh, if since you'd like debate, let me uh, provoke it a little bit <laughs> and say, I, I think it's largely irrelevant for most companies. It's not the problem. You know, the problem is you've got companies like IBM, which are doing so, such unusual and cool things uh, because they have all these resources to do it. And then you've got companies that are stuck in the nine box world. And the big breakthrough for these companies is not this, you know, getting the data to work. It is the inclination to look at data in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that is the basic idea of should we measure things, and if so, how do we do it, and how do we figure out whether this, how to make a case that this translates 
into business success or money. That's the big hurdle. Mm -hmm. And if you get that far, a lot of these other things you'll figure out, but there's no stomach or resources to get into the data stuff to hope that you'll make a case that somebody a level up will find persuasive enough to get you the resources to do it. That's the tail kind of wagging the dog on this stuff. Well, uh, I completely agree. I, I would come back to the nine box example. P part of the challenge is we haven't been innovating from within. Um, and some of it has to do with the, you know, the, the, some of the practitioners we work with day in and day out are just literally struggling to do the things that they've done historically, let alone think about how to position and solve for kind of the future. Um, but that's part of what I think has to happen because until it does, you, you just don't have the capacity inside the organization to make it happen. Can I, on, on the debate point, maybe it'll, it'll also bridge into a second one, which is um, HR as a function is spending some money. Most teams have uh, analytics teams, so it's not a, at a zero place. It's just, but the place where there's sort of shadow spend of significant amounts and places where my guess is some of the places where you occasionally run into opportunities is um, line of business heads or functional heads taking spending on talent solutions into their own hands, um, right? And so they're obviously seeing returns and uh, to spend their own money, oftentimes off, off the grid to make progress, whether it's sales is taking, you know, doing training on their own or the IT team is doing it. And so the idea that talent sort of moves to the quote unquote business or the line um, and that they're gonna spend independently on on talent related issues because HR is not serving them well enough. I think maybe it's an ROI issue, but some of it is also a speed and service model issue sure. that HR as a central function is struggling to keep up with rather than the money or ROI question isn't there. And I'm just curious how you see, <laughs> how you see non HR as buyer of talent products and offers as an issue. And I think for HR leaders, how do you think about that uh, line of command and control between what was the purview of traditional HR departments and what now might be in the lines of general managers and functional heads. Yeah, it's, um, so when I started the company, we tried to play the good soldier and um, go top down and talk to CHROs and executives. And uh, frankly, again, my theme might be frustrating in sales, but it, <laughs> it became a traditional enterprise sale where they had to play the ball game internally. They had to go talk to IT. IT is geared towards saying no to anything that you know is risky. Uh, they had to go talk to legal. Legal says no as well. Um, and so a quick conversation ends up being six nine months for something that you know we could do tomorrow. Um, so a year ago we said screw it. We're going to go talk to business leaders um, and go directly to general managers and business unit heads that need to understand their people to staff their teams and. Uh, deal with engagement and retention, and a very interesting thing happened. Like HR was thankful because if a business unit leader comes to them and says, "Oh yeah, we need this," then they have some you know air cover to actually yeah. get something done. So they started thanking us, even where we we're frankly going behind their back. Um, so uh, from a scrappy startup perspective, we've been pushed in the other direction just because it ended up being a faster path. I think it. You know, to you, we certainly have seen issues where you know we haven't been able to keep up with the pace of the the needs from a training perspective, and so um, we've used it as more of a partnership where we've brought the lead, you know, the the department leader in with HR and found the resources that we needed. Um, we're much more collaborative in that sense. There's there's no backdooring uh, <laughs> happening. Um, but that said, one really important note that we made um, over the last year was that we really needed to start evaluating enterprise talent, that we didn't want people to, to only think about their talent from a department perspective. Um, with a company that's growing as rapidly as we are, we really do need to be mindful of what uh, talent exists in other areas of the organization so that we can boost one another. Um, so we've been having much more um, in-depth conversations around our enterprise level talent management and what talent planning looks like for the enterprise. And it's been a much more, um, I think, valuable way to evaluate talent. Um, it's also opened up uh, promotional opportunities, uh, transition opportunities for individuals that were you know, potentially looking to leave the organization, maybe not getting um, the exposure that they wanted, and now suddenly having that opportunity because we as a senior leadership team 
are talking about what that enterprise talent looks like. Just uh, jump in this. Uh, just a quick question. Have you, has it struck uh, you folks too how uh, remarkable it is that virtually all the vendors in this space sell software? And the reason that's interesting and, and the, the thing we might want to think about is not all engagement of vendors signals an advancement of human resources. So a lot of it is done as a way to cut costs. That's the sell to the CFO, right? So if you talk to people in the recruitment outsourcing space, right, they say it's quite amazing. They say that what they hear from their clients is cost per hire, cost per hire, cost per hire. Quality of hire? No, they don't hear that. It's just cost per hire. Uh, and the reason that, that uh, software gets bought so often is not because of a positive statement. It's not that the organization feels this is really important, so we're investing in software. It is the organization figures that we could get rid of some HR people if we invest in <laughs> software, right? So I, th I think this is, you know, this is a bit of a conundrum. Uh, we don't want to think that, uh, you know, acquiring software is a sign that the organization has bought into something. Often it's the opposite, now, that it's a way, particularly in the hiring space, of making the case that we don't have to spend as much money on this we can outsource it because it's cheaper. I don't think we're getting a lot yet of, of people saying, we need to go outside because this will be a lot better. We'll be better at learning. We'll be better at talent management. So far, the stories mainly seem to be about cheaper. I'm going to build, I don't know what you said, excuse me. Um, I think what you described is a, a healthy sign of your HR group. Um, I think when organizations can start broadening and looking at talent throughout the enterprise, that is a great sign. They're not hoarding talent. They're developing cross-functionally. And in fact, that's helping folks get broader development experiences. That's going to shape leaders for the future. Um, going to, to your comment or your question, Aaron, um, just thoughts on you know, the H, some of the HR and training going into this business. I actually think it's a good thing. I really do. Um, but it, it requires collaboration. I think we need to redefine the roles of HR. We need to redefine the role that leaders, and I can only speak on in my world of biotech and pharma, our sales leaders, they have to play an active role in talent management. Um, you know, all the way from starting an acquisition to retention and even, you know, appropriate attrition. Um, but it comes down to that collaboration. I can speak to when I first joined um, Santa Fe Genzyme, uh, one of the things that I quickly noticed was just all great intent. People were moving 1,000 miles an hour. Everybody had the same goal, but the people just didn't have enough time to do everything. What we didn't have is forums where we had not just the heads of these functions, but the next level and the next level sitting down on a consistent basis cross-functionally cross and talking about these things to say, okay, traditionally HR has done X, Y, and Z for training in leadership development, but the business wants to do A, B, and C. How do we work together to pull that off? We were able to take a very top-down, HR-focused only approach to training and to talent management and make it a, a partnership. We were able to bring uh, the outside in. We brought in folks like Dan Heath to come in to the business as well as HR and all the marketing teams to talk about how do you lead change and change is hard. That would never have been done. That was an idea that came through learning, it came through sales, it came through marketing, it came through HR. It's just a great example of when you work together, the turf war of HR versus whoever's supposed to do it, that goes away. Mm -hmm. So I think the collaboration is key. Mm. Is there, um, you know, if you look out into the future and you sort of think about it, it's been hard to have an ROI case for investment, or even in HR generally, whether it's through HR resources or through new innovations that is on the upside other than at the, the line of business. Um, a lot of conversations that we have in our uh, network, um, there's a, obviously the looming debate around um, overall employment levels given where technology will go, and are big companies gonna be adding headcount over the next couple of years or not? And, What's HR's role in that debate if, if significant chunks of jobs can be automated? Um, you know, where is the role of, head, of HR in that decision and, and helping manage that transition? But I, I'm more curious around, is there anything that sits out on the horizon that changes that debate, that makes the ROI easier, it makes the conversation easier around investments generally in talent, that the, there's a conventional wisdom that it's important, 
um, but it hasn't been as easy to get it. Is, is there something out there that is optimistic and exciting that will make all of this journey sort of easier for, for all of us that want to pursue this, or is it sort of as it's been for a long time, a, a, a pretty uh, uphill battle in some of these things? How, how is it that retention, engagement, and cost of hire are not upsides? I mean, I, I agree that there's lots of software that's bought for cost savings, but that's somewhat a challenge of how the organization is selling it and viewing it versus what the opportunity is. I mean, but, uh, when we sell our software and our data, it's to help companies do a better job of keeping their employees around. Mm -hmm. It's about retention and about um, alignment between business strategy and companies um, and what they pay. So I, I actually think that um, uh, we may perhaps naively so think that it's all about upside. It's okay. all about organizations hanging on to talent that they've trained for three, four, five years and not having that walk out the door. Right. So. I would totally agree with you. For us, you know, when we're looking at evaluating new systems, you, all of these systems are great. They streamline things. They put things more in your face. Right? They help you to understand what's really happening. But at the end of the day, we care about why are employees here? What do they want? What motivates them? What drives them? You know, if you, if you can create an environment that really motivates and drives employees, the, pro the, the, the output that you're going to get from them is huge in comparison to, you know, those folks that are just kind of coming in and getting the job done because that's what's required of them. So you really, you have to kind of take a step back for a minute and again ask yourselves, what do I want to know? And the reality is we want to know why you want to be here. So we spend a lot of time in talking to our folks and asking questions and not being afraid of what the answers are because we're not going to always like what we get, what we hear. But we need to be able to address those things because retaining our talent, especially in an environment where we're growing as quickly as we are, is really important. Um, so, you know, I do think that systems get us so far, and I I look for systems that can help us to understand it better. But, you know, nothing's going to replace the human aspect of really understanding the why behind it. Uh, I think, and maybe just go back to the ROI point, I think ROI has been a red herring for human resources for a long time because, you know, the, the little secret of, of business school research is that we can't demonstrate an ROI from anything, you know? Marketing, uh, strategy, I mean, there's just nothing that you can show that consistently generates a return on company performance. and. You know, it's always, it's not surprising. If you thought that there was one thing you could do and what, this function here that would drive shareholder value, that would be kind of astonishing. So it's not about ROI. It's about making a sensible business case, right? And a sensible business case would be something like, I heard somebody the other day telling in their company that they were looking at the turn time in terms of engineering, right? How long it took them to hire uh, and put people into the jobs and what their product cycle was looking like. And th it was a kind of logical story for the folks at the top about why we have a problem here. And that's sufficient. You don't have to generate a finance-based ROI, because we can't do it really anywhere, and everybody who claims that they're doing it is making it up, including an entire industry of consultants, right? You could make that stuff go away in a half a second with the right changes and assumptions, right? So I think that, that it's the business case that matters, but also let's not kid ourselves. If you're in a business, you might be fortunate enough to be in a company where the folks at the top, either because turnover is a big deal or just dispositionally, they believe that employee engagement and stuff like that really matters and they're willing to put money behind it. But for every one of those folks, there are two CFOs who think it's nonsense. And being able to persuade those folks is, is the hard thing. And you can do that by going over their head. Right? Um, so there's an interesting book coming out. It's got nothing to do with, with me by Ram Sharam and Dennis uh, Carey and some other folks. And they've been going around looking at big companies and finding a partnership that they're seeing between the HR, the CFO, and the CEO guys. They're, they're calling it, I think, G3 now. Uh, and it's a pretty interesting thing. And what's going on in those companies is that the HR folks or somebody has been able to make the case to the folks at the CEO level that there is a business imperative to doing what they're doing. 
which is not a general statement that engagement is a good thing, and it's not an ROI statement, but it is a statement about here are our business problems, here's how what we're doing solves the business problems in a persuasive way. Uh, and I think that's still what's kind of holding us up, back to the you know, earlier point. And I think the ROI thing has been kind of a, uh, a red herring. It's kept, it's kept HR people who, many of them are afraid of finance stuff, from even putting their toes in the water and making a sensible case. And if you're an HR person, I just uh, suggest that you, you take a model from marketing, right? Take a lesson from marketing. They can't prove anything in marketing. <laughs> and, yet, and yet they take credit for everything, right? Anything that's any improvement in the company, it's a result of marketing, right? Uh, so we don't have to be quite so timid as, uh, as maybe we've been before. I would maybe just build on that point because one of the other topics we want to talk about was the role of the CHRO in the C-suite in sort of selling it, its, its wares in a way. And I love that idea of uh, taking a playbook out of, of marketing's you know, uh, strategy with a similar ROI challenge. Um, you know, I, I think Peter shared a little bit about how that's emerging. I think you know, from the practitioner side, how do you see it, the trajectory over the last, you know, let's say five years, and is there any place where that curve kind of changes and, and, and you start to, you know, whether it's academics bring a new perspective that gets a lot of traction, are there things that actually start to solidify those relationships? Um, one thing that we've seen emerging is um, actually the splitting of the CHRO or head of HR job into two jobs, and one being sort of a board uh, CEO coach, that's sort of rep strategic representative, and then a second that's much more tactical about you know, getting the work done of payroll and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, largely in the tech sector that we've seen people start to emerge that. But just curious, you know, building on how, how those relationships at the top of the house, where they stand today and where they might be going in the future. I think that uh, the CHRO role, is, at least hopefully by 2020, they're gonna actually be accountable for profit margin. Um, I, I think we need to run it like a business. I know that it's not necessarily super easy to correlate everything, but I think when we have everybody sitting at the table accountable for the profit margin and the results, it's gonna help drive and change things. I also see organizations um, moving towards also splitting another hair off of HR and having a chief learning officer. Um, not to say that the CHRO can't do that, it's just we know that employee engagement does drive a lot of results. We know that our millennials want development. We know that millennials are saying, hey, I know what my HR benefits are, are what I get for that, but how much learning investment am I getting on an annual basis? And when they dedicate a, a chief learning officer to sit at that table with the CFO, with the CEO, with the CHRO, uh, there's a lot of magic that can happen. And again, it comes back down to this collaboration across these functions that can drive it. I, I see the CHRO role um, continuing to grow. I don't see it going away. Um, I know there's lots of talk about that. I see it elevating in a way that it's far more strategic. It's a true business partner held accountable to results um, and pushing a lot of the administrative responsibilities into systems and processes that, that maybe we can let technology take more care of. Um, but that CLO role is something um, that I've seen more and more organizations, regardless of size, really pick up. Um, to be a, a great partner at, at that table. Just, I spent last week with two groups of CHROs, two associations of CHROs, and I think this, this uh, idea about splitting them out, that came from Ram Sharam about a year ago, right? And, and I think, uh, as much as I love Ram, I think uh, the assumption he was making was companies weren't getting good at talent management because the HR folks didn't know how to do it. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's because the folks at the top didn't want to put any money behind it to make it happen. I do see a lot of folks at the very top, particularly in big companies, the CHROs, wanting to be the concierge to the CEO and hang out with the CEO and think about placing people in boards and that sort of stuff. I think if they gravitate in that direction, it's the death of the human resource function, though. Because what that means is they personally become, spend all their time on placements and hanging out with the board and that stuff. But the function underneath them just disappears. And yes, there's an administrative function underneath of stuff that gets outsourced, right? The process stuff. But somebody has to be responsible for how the people in the organization drive the business. Mm -hmm. And if the CHRO hangs out with the board and is just the concierge to the CEO and all the administrative stuff gets outsourced. There's nothing left for them to do. So I think that's a really, really bad idea. 
Um, although you can see how it's happening. I mean, I can, I, I won't name companies, but <laughs> I can see a lot of them where it is so seductive for the CHRO to do that and be spending time with the CEO. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a worrisome thing if it actually happens. You asked, the, one of the questions you asked us to think about was, is there an HR less enterprise or? Yeah. Uh, and I, I would just pick up off of uh, the, the prior point, which is I, I, my answer to that is no, because there's just there's the the um, job of tending to your human capital is not something that you can outsource either outside the company or to your line managers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it it requires a lot of expertise and thought and energy and insight that's just not going to come from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So. Um, which I think also, you know, we, I don't know if we have any companies, customers that have CHROs, right? So that's just the, but the, to me, the, the talent or the magic happens when HR is brought into the conversation and that they're, they're empowered and, and they're respected, right? Which is kind of the, the yeah. broader point. Yeah, so. I think just a, a little historical analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, we've come off probably the last 10 years of the worst period in American history for human resources? Hmm. Probably is, right? Because it was a, a period of big downturn in the economy. It was no trouble hiring people. There was no trouble retaining people. And the priority was to cut, 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 cut. And one of the things that happened in line management is the supervisory role got shrunk down. So supervisors span a control increase. They became individual contributors as well. Um, they stopped doing serious performance appraisals a long time ago. And so they were lobbing stuff back to the human resource function to take over, like managing careers and that sort of stuff. And the HR function was itself cut down and they're trying to lob things back to the, to the line management to do. But it all reflects this fact that at the very top of the house, they just didn't care much about this. And the reason they didn't care about it is it didn't matter that much, to be honest, right? And when we were looking at unemployment rates of seven, or, you know, seven eight, nine, ten percent you didn't have to be a very good manager in order to get work done because people were still scared to death. You didn't have to retain people. It wasn't hard to do. It wasn't hard to hire people. And so right now what's happening is we're coming into something which looking historically a little normal, right? So being old enough now to <laughs> be able to say this, it's nothing unusual about what's going on now. Labor markets are going to tighten up a little bit. Companies are going to start paying more attention to this stuff. It'll be slow, uh, but they s will start to do it. Um, and it will be sped along if HR can make this business case, right? I think that's, we're coming back to that over and over again, right? One last piece that we wanted to touch on was just the role of culture, how you measure culture. Um, one thing you do hear CEOs talk a lot about, uh, we track the text of every analyst call that a CEO does, and it's the, the thing you see going up and up and up in terms of uh, both positive cultural attributes and using culture as a reason why a thing has failed or you have missed a number. And so that is a very uh, sort of constant refrain that CEOs care about, see it as their job, um, but hard to measure, inconsistently measured. Um, I'm curious both, maybe start with the CEOs, with their CEO hat on, as uh, we probably have uh, venture CEOs in the audience. You know, how in, in running your companies mm. do you think about that? And then maybe we can go to the practitioner side a little bit about how you assist CEOs in that. Um, we've got about six minutes left, so. Um, I think culture is one of the, obviously one of the biggest drivers in the talent wars, right? Yeah. Especially in the valley where uh, I come from, there's no loyalty, you know, there's, <laughs> this, this notion of working for a company for, for 20 years is complete, if you, if you make it two years at a company, that's impressive. And it's all driven by culture. You know, the, the Phil Libbins over at Evernotes, the, the Lotto Box that have set up this environment where going back to the CHRO function, they're evolving into the champion of the employee. Like uh, so many companies I talk to, HR has still got a bit of an adversarial relationship with many of the employees. So how do you change that culture? HR is the champion of the culture, the champion of the employee. And I hope as my company becomes a unicorn and I make billions of dollars and hire thousands of people that I can establish that and, and follow in those footsteps. But obviously the biggest part, which I'm sure a high growth company it's a war of attrition, right? You get a little nitpicked all the time and it's hard to kind of, you start off very idealistic and then reality sets in. So I'm just curious how you dealt with it. Yeah, I, I think that one, I'm very fortunate because I work for an organization that our CEO and co-founder, Chip Pausick, um, has been 100% committed to culture from day one. 
He, has, he places an extremely high value on it. Um, I think he spends at least 50% of his time on culture. And so, you know, that matters. It matters that your CEO is that bought in and it matters that your executive leadership team is bought in as well. Um, and, and knowing what that means, right? What do we care about? What are we, what is our mission? What, how do we care about getting that accomplished? You know, that the how behind what you do matters. Um, establishing your values and making sure that those values are really weaved into the fabric of who you are as an organization is really important. Um, and so you have to create this, this environment where your employees understand what you value, that you value them, and you have to understand what it is that drives them. So I think if you, if you think that culture just happens, you're very wrong. Um, culture is very intentional, and it's a lot of work, and you have to remain committed to it. You have to constantly be evaluating, constantly be asking questions, surveying yourself, surveying your folks, understanding um, how things are working. And, and honestly, you know, Wendy and I were talking just before, if something's not working, stop immediately. Cut bait, <laughs> try something new. Um, but don't try and force an issue. Um, you know, you have to really be mindful. Um, it's work every single day. Agreed. Uh, the culture piece is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm a huge believer when you get the people piece right in any organization, whether you're a group of 10 or you're a group of 120,000, when you get that right, the rest follows. But it starts with great leadership. And to your point, it's got to start with the CEO, at least in some regards. I mean, there are some that are totally on board, and there's some, to your point earlier, they're just, they're not. But if they're somewhere in the middle, that executive board, they have to believe in it. And it can't be lip service. Um, because your employees that are independent, uh, individual contributors, they can believe in the culture and want it, but there's a big challenge if the, the folks in the middle aren't there. So you need those executive leaders to live and breathe and eat culture and spread it through the organization. Um, I also think we overcomplicate culture. And I think it's just because it's such a soft skills topic, it's kind of squishy, right? There's no perfect algorithm or map to say, go do these 42 things and boom, you're gonna have a great culture. It doesn't work that way. Uh, culture is a feeling and there's a human element to it. But we don't have to do things that are so grandiose. So whether I was you know, at a Fortune 100 or 500 company doing this or in my own consulting, I always recommend let's just start small. And Aaron mentioned, you know, you gotta understand what drives people. There's a, a great book by uh, Matthew Kelly called The Dream Manager. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Great, simple book that you can build an entire year around with your organization that really just says when, when you understand what drives the people who drive your organization in terms of what their dreams are, it's a win-win for them because you can help them achieve those dream, dreams that are small or large. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, just Google it and, and check it out. Um, he's got a, a quick couple minute video on it. Um, again, start small. Um, you don't have to overthink this culture thing, but you have to be intentional. Could just make a, qu a quick uh, follow up here. I think one of the reasons culture is so popular is because people have very different understandings of what it means and everybody thinks they're agreeing when they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so even on the panel here, you know, we're talking about motivation, we're talking about commitment issues, we're talking about mission issues, and then there's culture per se, right, which is something different than those. Uh, but I think the key thing about culture, which is why it's hard, is culture flows from practices. You could say whatever you want about what the culture of the organization should be. You could communicate any values you want, but people learn the culture from what you actually do. And the problem in changing culture is somebody at the top has to actually do things differently if you want to change the culture, and that's where we always bump into stuff. It is really important, but it's not a, you know, it's not a communication exercise, and it's not a statement of values, right? It's about how you actually do things. I think one key theme yeah. that I'm hearing this whole time, and I see time and time again, is that that executive buy-in on whatever the initiative is, especially as it pertains to HR, anything, that is key. And without that, all these great ideas, um, they could fall flat. You also have to be willing to evolve. You know, you can't, you can't just kind of get stuck in the way that you feel it should be um, or the way that it was, right? Things change and you have to be willing to evolve with that. Great. Um, 
I think we're almost at time. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I think if we were trying to summarize uh, where we are, um, I do think that there is immense hope in what data and analytics are going to do for what it means to be an employee and how resources are allocated across companies. Um, I do very much agree with Peter. I, we're in the middle of a big study around um, when there's a disconnect between a cultural value and a process, that's on the CEO to change rather than on the employee to uh, process. And I think there are many companies that don't work through that very well. Um, and I think the lastly that um, this sort of tension around the role of talent and who and where that it is owned, whether it's a line manager that's actually on the hook for an outcome or can, can the CHRO uh, evolve without getting lost into the, the private plane uh, problem, uh, I think will be a very interesting uh, debate. So thank you all for being here and uh, we'll be up here for questions as we transition to the next one. Thank you.